For this episode, we're really just going to cover one thing. That thing happens to be the hatch assembly on our 91 Firebird. We ended up having issues with several parts of this assembly, so we'll be addressing different issues, but this video was definitely not meant as a complete guide. In case anyone out there isn't familiar with these, most 3rd gen F bodies use a motor assembly to lift up the hatch when opening it and pull it back down when closing it. It's kind of a cool novelty, but my understanding is that they introduced these electric fold-down assemblies to prevent people from slamming and breaking the rear glass. But it also means that the system is kinda complicated and there are several components of it that are prone to failure. All the way back in July of 2018 when we first bought this car, the hatch assembly was just barely working. You could pop the hatch up with the key and then you could kinda lift it by hand, the motor would come on and off a little bit and eventually you could get it open, but it definitely wasn't ideal. With the hatch open, you could kinda wiggle the wires around and get the motor to fully descend. And a very cursory examination of the wiring revealed some pretty obvious faults. First up, the relay and its connector are definitely not supposed to be full of rust. After realizing this, it was absolutely no surprise that this system was not working the way it was supposed to. The factory service manual refers to this as the extend relay. Clearly, this one should be replaced, although the functionality of the relay isn't entirely make or break, but we'll touch on that more later. In order for the relay to carry the current it's supposed to, these contacts have to be, at the very least, cleaned up. Other than the relay, the most obvious problem with this assembly is how loose the latch assembly is since the plastic guides it rides on have fallen apart. All of that play is definitely not doing this mechanism or the questionable wiring any favors. In pretty much all of these cars, these plastic guides will fall apart with time and use. There are some companies that make aftermarket replacement guides and we'll install some of those later in this video. Some people who get really fed up will just weld the latch assembly at its lowermost position and then the hatch can be open and closed like any other vehicle. Another solution that we happened to see on this 1989 Camaro in a parts yard was just simply to ram screws through and lock the assembly down. It's maybe not the most elegant, but it does appear that it did the job. And unlike the welding, this would be easily reversible. I've also heard of people using a screw to lock the motor shaft in place if the gearbox fails. Some early 3rd gen F bodies do have a manual latch assembly, like in this 1984 Camaro we also found in a parts yard. I'm not sure exactly what would be required to swap one of these into a later model and it would probably just be easier to lock the pull down mechanism in place. So if absolutely everything else fails, I think we can keep those modification options in the back of our heads. But before we come to anything like that, we'll actually try to fix the electronic lift. The first step we'll take is taking another look at that relay. If we can get the crusty thing back off of that connector. There we go, okay, let's look at these terminals. I had started to do an initial cleaning when I noticed this terminal in the corner here is not looking so good. It's become so badly corroded that it's barely even connected, it's just kinda hanging on. So this relay is toast and we're going to need a new one. I looked all around and was completely unable to find a replacement relay listed for this assembly. But luckily I recognize this as being the same relay that GM used for the fuel pump in my 1988 S10 Blazer and just ordered one of those. There is the crusty original relay versus our shiny-ish new one. I had gone through and very carefully cleaned the connector up with a wire brush and a little file so it's in decent enough shape to reuse it. And to hopefully prevent any future corrosion, we'll slather the whole thing with dielectric grease and plug in our new relay. Right near it in the wiring loom, there are also two of these single wire connectors and we'll apply some dielectric grease and just reconnect them since they appear to be in good shape. There's also this four pin connector that goes to the motor switch assembly and we'll disconnect that to take a look. We'll use that same file and our dentist picks to clean up those terminals and make sure the contact is going to be good. With the terminals on the switch assembly and in the connector cleaned, we'll apply some more dielectric grease and plug that back in. This connection feels pretty loose, but if it works, it works, so for now we're going to leave it. And it's time to test our new relay and cleaned up contacts. Uh, yeah, once you lightly close it, the motor is supposed to grab the latch and pull the hatch down tight. 
It didn't seem like it wanted to do anything at all, so I opened and closed it a few times and wiggled the wiring around, which is usually what would fix it before, and kept trying to close it. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't working at all. In fact, it worked better than this before I ever touched the thing. So I think we're gonna have to take these electronics apart and get a better look at what's going on here. It's tricky to do this leaning over the back and looking at everything upside down in a cramped space, so let's just remove the whole lift assembly. To do this, we'll remove the motor connector again, then we'll remove the three torque screws holding the plastic motor gearbox to the steel bracket. And once those screws have been removed, the whole assembly is loose and we can just slide it out of the bottom of the rails. And as we do, the remainders of those plastic guides fall right off. For now, we'll just set those aside since we're worrying about the electrical component here first. The lift motor is held to the latch assembly by a pin, which is retained by this spring clip. We'll just use a small flat blade screwdriver and work our way around the clip to pop it loose. And with the push lock clip out of the way, we can slide out the pin and separate these two parts of the assembly. We'll let the latch part of the assembly just gently hang there off of its release cable and take a close look at the motor. This plastic motor housing is another extremely common failure for these assemblies. As we saw, there's not a heck of a lot holding this motor assembly to the body, and all it takes to break this housing is somebody slamming the hatch closed. But ours were still moving sometimes, and I'm pretty sure the issue we're having is of an electrical nature. The first thing we'll look at is this connector we tried to clean up. The outer part that the connector actually clips into is a separate piece, which is why this connection feels so loose, and we'll try to remove it to get a better look. It's just clipped onto the switch assembly, and we can lift it off with the flat blade screwdriver. And with that off, we can finally take a good look at the contacts. There's definitely some corrosion in there that we weren't able to clean up before. We'll give each of these pins a little push to make sure they all feel sturdy. First one feels good, second one feels good, third one feels good, and the fourth one practically falls right off. So it would seem that the connection here may have been a bit compromised by all of this corrosion. Since we're hoping the rest of the assembly is okay, we're going to try to salvage this connection. To make it easier, we'll fully disconnect the switch assembly from the motor housing. We'll just remove this one Phillips screw and slide the whole thing off. So here's the rest of our corroded and extra blue switch assembly. Specifically, this little plastic toggle switch here controls the direction that the motor will turn in. When the system is working properly, this switch is tripped at the top and bottom of travel. With the switch in one position, the motor will turn to raise the assembly up, and after it's flipped to the opposite side, the motor will turn the other way to lower the assembly down. So clearly, this switch is a vital part of the assembly, and we're going to need all four of its connections to actually work. And here is the bodge wire that I ended up installing to do that. I couldn't think of a good way to just fix that one pin, so I figured the other three connections will go through that same four pin connector, and outside of that, we'll just use a single wire connector for this fourth lead. It's definitely not an ideal solution, but it was the best and easiest way I could come up with to save this switch. Once the wire was soldered onto that trace and we tested to make sure we had a good connection to it, we applied a little bit of epoxy to make sure that wire was going to stay put, and threw in a zip tie for an extra layer of security. So we'll have to bypass that connector for the one wire, but otherwise the switch seems to be working the way it should, and we can reinstall it. But that switch wasn't the only problematic one in our lift assembly. With the latch assembly apart, we were also able to take a good look at the switch it uses. And what do you know, this one has some serious corrosion issues too. These three wires pass directly into the body of the switch, and they're pretty much already broken off. This switch is also not one that's easily obtainable, so I'll see what I can do to save it. Just like the other switch, there's just one bolt that holds this in place, and once it's removed, we have the thing free of the car. Well, normally it would still be connected to some of those wires, but we didn't have that issue. Which is kind of the problem. It was pretty tricky, but eventually I was able to get little dots of solder on each of those connection points. And with that in place, we'll use a multimeter to test the switch. That way we know it mechanically works before we spend all this time trying to get wires attached to it. With the leads connected to the left side and middlemost contact, these two are normally open, and when the switch is activated, this circuit closes. 
With the center contact and the rightmost one, the switch is normally closed, and when it's activated, the circuit opens. Clearly, our little dots of solder appear to be attached, so we tinned up three little wires and connected them to the switch. Just like the other switch, after we solder them in place, we'll apply some epoxy to hopefully take the strain off those little connections. And once that's cured, here's what we're now working with. We'll repeat the same test as before, except we can now clip the multimeter leads onto our little pigtails. These two close when the switch is actuated, and the connection between these two opens. We also tested the other switch we repaired in the same way, and it appeared to be functioning correctly. So it's time to wire things back up and see if we can get the hatch to work. We'll start with the more straightforward task, and that's reconnecting the three wires for the latch switch. We'll strip off a bit of insulation, slide on a piece of heat shrink, and use an uninsulated butt crimp to connect the body harness wires to the pigtail that we created on the switch. And once the wires are firmly crimped together, we'll slide the heat shrink over those connections and apply some heat. It's worth noting that applying an open flame is not a good technique for using heat shrink tubing. But if you're working outside and the wind keeps blowing out the flame of the lighter, as long as you're careful not to burn the heat shrink and make sure it's still flexible at the end, it should be fine. Anyway, the latch switch is on the body harness, and once we reassemble everything, hopefully it will function as it's supposed to. We'll do a very similar thing to the pigtail wire that we attached for the motor reversing switch, except we crimped on spade connectors in case we had to remove things in the future. And since our two switches are, theoretically, kinda sorta repaired, it's time to put everything back together. We'll put that reversing switch back onto the motor assembly and reinstall the one hold down screw. Then we'll put that aside for a second and reinstall the latch switch to the latch assembly with its one screw. And once that has carefully been snugged down, we'll reattach the latch and motor assemblies. We'll line up that eyelet on the motor assembly, reinstall its pin, and push back on that retaining spring clip. Since at this time I didn't have the new guides yet, we just had to kind of slap the old broken guides back on so that we can at least test the function of the assembly. Then the whole unit slides back into the channels on the body, and we can reinstall the torque screws that thread into the motor gearbox. Since these thread into that reportedly brittle plastic, it's definitely a good idea to be careful with them. Now all we have to do is take that connector with its three wire leads and plug it back into the motor reversing switch. And we'll plug back in the relay that I had removed for testing purposes. So finally the whole assembly is back together. And fingers crossed, we'll try to close the hatch. The motor grabbed the hatch, pulled it down, and locked it down exactly as it's supposed to. Now we'll use the key in the back to release it and make sure the latch lifts back up. And look at that, we're gonna call that a total success. The only thing that is a bit concerning is how hard the hatch releases when you unlatch it. It takes a fairly stiff turn of the key, and if you use the electronic release on the dashboard, it takes three or four button presses to actually release it. But before worrying too much about any of that, let's replace the guides in the lift assembly and see if that improves anything. I got this set of replacement nylon guides off of eBay for about 20 bucks. This set is for an 86 to 91 Camaro or Firebird, since partway through the generation there was a design change for the hatch pulldown. Our 91 Firebird is obviously at the very tail end of the generation and it has the newer style. In fact, to farther complicate things, partway through 1991 they actually tweaked the design again. Luckily, the design of these guides hasn't changed, but another part in the kit is a little piece of pipe and it doesn't seem to fit anything. I think that piece and the included lock washer are supposed to be for the pin that goes through the eyelet coming out of the motor gearbox. Unfortunately, that means we can't use the part from the kit on our assembly, and it does seem like we have a bit of play there, so it would be good to address that somewhere down the line. For now though, we're just going to replace the guides since they should fit. So we'll pop the hatch open, and just like we did previously, take the pull-down assembly apart. This time we're going to be removing as little as possible, so we'll just remove the three gearbox hold-down screws and slide the whole assembly out of the channels on the body. Then we can just knock off the crusty old guides and get ready to install the new ones. We'll clean out the old grease and polish the channels up just a little bit with some red Scotch-Brite. Then we'll clean them again and apply some grease. I don't imagine it matters too much which kind of grease is used, we'll just use some brake grease since it's easy to get it into those channels. 
And after that's spread around and evenly distributed, we'll pop the four new shiny nylon guides onto the pull-down assembly and slide that back into place. Luckily, everything goes together correctly and easily. Then we'll reinstall the screws that attach the motor gearbox to the body and test the unit out by manually depressing the latch switch. The movement of everything is smooth now, and more importantly, it doesn't wobble all over the place. But we seem to have a different electrical issue that has come back up. It was a little tricky and it took some time to figure out exactly how this pull-down mechanism is supposed to function, but to the best of my understanding, here it is. When the hatch is closed, the latch depresses the latch switch and the motor pulls the assembly downwards. Once it hits the bottom, it triggers the reversing switch, which cuts off power to the motor. Then once the mechanical locking latch is released, either via the release solenoid or a key in the tail panel of the car, the hatch lifts up off of the latch switch and the motor runs in the opposite direction which lifts the assembly upwards. In the downward direction, the mechanical locking latch has already grabbed on and holds the latch switch fully depressed all the way down. But even with new struts, due to the weight of the hatch, in the upwards direction it doesn't necessarily have the guarantee that the switch won't be pressed. And that is what the extend relay is for. The extend relay is energized when the hatch is opened, and until the reversing switch is flipped at the top of travel, it keeps the motor powered regardless of the position of the switch. This provides a smooth lift and ensures that the assembly reaches the top of its travel to flip that reversing switch and be ready to retract. After replacing those guides, once again that function is not working. But annoyingly, when the wires were wiggled, it did start to work. At this point, since things mostly worked, I decided to just leave it alone. It was quite a while, in fact almost two years, before I got back to it. And it wasn't until I figured out the function of the relay that everything, well, clicked. And I realized that the hatch functioned the same whether or not the relay was installed. I used a multimeter to test the wiring and it seemed okay, so fingers were starting to point in the direction of our new replacement relay. To test it on its own, we could set up a bench test, but we actually already have something just as good ready to go. Remember that this relay is the same one used by our S10 Blazer for its fuel pump. And since carburetor swapping it, the fuel pump is just run off of a toggle switch on the dashboard. Which means the control side is a very simple toggle switch circuit, and the power side has a load on it, the fuel pump, so that we can test the relay in real world working conditions. All we have to do is unplug the existing relay and hook up the grey one. And what do you know, when we toggle the switch, nothing happens. So it sure seems like that relay is kaput. But to totally confirm this, let's remove the working fuel pump relay from the blazer and pop it into the wiring harness on the Firebird. With the working relay in place, once again the electric portion of the pull-down assembly is functioning. The relay being bad explains the intermittent function and a lot of the weird symptoms. I don't think the relay even worked for a week before it started acting up, and at this point it doesn't seem like it works at all. So at least now I know what the problem is and I will try to get another relay. Just goes to show that even with new parts, and especially with cheap ones, there is no guarantee that they're going to work. Around the same time we figured out the relay problem, there are a few other things we wanted to try to improve. One of which is the plastic bushing for the pin in the gearbox assembly. The one that the guide replacement part kit included a replacement for, that unfortunately did not fit our car. The bushing is pretty worn out, and even though the part from the kit didn't fit, I thought I might be able to find some kind of replacement if I took the bushing out and measured it. So, once again, we ended up taking the gearbox out of the car. We removed the flat lock washer for the pin with the flat-headed screwdriver, and then pushed the pin out. Then we finished removing the gearbox screws, and slid the motor and gearbox out the bottom. It's not ideal, but for now we'll kinda just leave everything hanging. The bushing didn't want to pop out by hand, so we had to give it a little bit of a pry with some flathead screwdrivers. Using those, we very quickly got it out. At this point, I was kind of just looking around at the motor gearbox and I noticed a crack in the plastic housing. These don't exactly have a reputation for durability, but this one is, at the moment, still intact. So I decided we could remove it from the vehicle, apply some epoxy, and hopefully strengthen the cracked area. For a different view of how everything works, here's the motor running when detached from the latch mechanism. 
On the motor shaft is a worm gear, which turns this main gear that is threaded internally, and so when the motor spins, it raises and lowers that link rod. While playing with this, I also noticed that the grease inside was, not too surprisingly, totally dried out. I was thinking about just re-greasing the inside and pretending I had never seen the cracks on the gearbox. So to take a look inside, I removed the motor from the gearbox by removing its two screws. What I didn't expect was that the brush assembly would stay on the gearbox side. For whatever it's worth, there's plenty of meat left on the brushes and everything in here looks okay. I kinda half-heartedly started to grease the thing and then I realized it would be better to just take it all apart on the bench. So instead of working on it, leaning over the back of the Firebird, let's remove it entirely from the car. The last thing holding it in were the two little zip ties that we had used to take some of the load off the limit switch connector, so we'll cut those and take it over to the bench. Despite the design appearing pretty complex, there are actually only a few pieces in this gearbox. The brush assembly just lifts out once the motor has been removed, so really the only other thing to remove is this steel base plate and the link rod. That is just held in with two Torx screws. Once they've been removed, give it a little bit of a tug and everything pops right out of the gearbox. We'll have to keep track of these parts and make sure it goes back together the same way it came apart. Between the main gear and the gearbox was this spring washer. With that set aside, we can unscrew the main gear from the link rod and remove the bearing. And that is almost everything. We'll take some time to clean everything up and get a better look at things. Carb Cleaner and Scotch Brite worked great for the steel link rod in its space plate, though not unexpectedly, it did discolor the clear gearbox a little bit. I kind of figured it would, and I knew better, but I was also being kind of lazy. Once it was clean, I could see that there was actually one part left in that gearbox. There's this little pressed in support bushing that holds the end of the motor shaft. We'll use a pin punch to knock it out so we can clean it up. And now that we could take a really good look at the housing, it was clear there wasn't just the one crack. In fact, just about every screw hole and mounting boss on the gearbox was at least a little bit damaged. Somehow, surprisingly, it was all still in one piece, so I decided to just go ahead and epoxy the crap out of the outside of this thing. Another common failure is this main gear stripping out, although ours appears to be in very good shape. It is hideously filthy, but since the teeth look good, we'll do what we can to clean it off. And with just a little bit of soap and water and scrubbing, it's looking a heck of a lot better. But what about that plastic bushing? I did take the measurements for it, but unfortunately I was not able to find a replacement. There's gotta be some piece of pipe or something out there that would fit this correctly. But unfortunately I couldn't find anything sitting around that I could make work. So I went straight to the old tried and true method of just shoving a piece of tape in there. There's not much actual rotation that happens here while the pin is installed, so hopefully the vinyl tape will stay in place and it should take up a little bit of that extra slop. As is often the case, it's not an ideal solution, but it should at least be a little bit better. Three weeks and three layers of slathered on epoxy later, I actually needed to drive the car, so we finally got back to putting this gearbox back together. And the first thing we need to do is get the motor shaft bushing pressed back into place. We were able to do this easily by using an awl to apply just a little bit of force, and now things are about to get messy because out comes the grease. We're just going to be using a generic wheel bearing grease, which is probably thicker than what it came with, but it should work just fine. We'll go ahead and goop up all of the surfaces that are going to have moving parts on them, starting with that shaft bushing. To get the motor ready to reinstall, we need to reunite it with the brush assembly and get the brushes back into place on the commutator. With everything open, this is very easy to do and we'll just use a flathead screwdriver to compress the brush springs and slide that back into the motor housing. Then we can reinstall the motor onto the gearbox. We'll also reinstall this little piece of black plastic which helps hold down the terminals for the motor connector. I decided to wait on installing the screws until everything was together, but you certainly could do it at this point. We'll get back to gooping up that gearbox with grease, and we'll pack the bearing as best we can. We thoroughly cleaned all the old grease off of the inside ball bearing elements, and we need to make sure it's all replaced with fresh grease. Then we'll grease the inside threads and the teeth on the main gear. We'll get that reassembled, starting with the spring washer, then the main gear, then the bearing in the gearbox. To get the link rod and its backing plate reinstalled, it needs to be at least partially threaded into that main gear before it can slide in. 
But once the link rod was in its slot correctly and we tried to get the backing plate to sit flush, I realized that some of the epoxy was creating a clearance problem. It was on an inside corner where it would have been difficult to remove just the epoxy and I was in a bit of a hurry. So I decided that the easiest thing to do was just to cover up all the greasy parts and cut the corner off of that backing plate. I don't think removing this little locating nub would cause any problems because it's pretty securely located by its position on the gearbox anyway. We'll clean up the edge just a bit with some sandpaper then get back to reassembling the gearbox. Everything slides right in so we can reinstall the screws and lock down the backing plate. All of these screws are just threaded into the plastic so we're using the torque spec of, oh please, oh please don't break, please god don't break, for each one of them. And once those screws are tight, we'll reinstall the two motor screws. So there we go, there is our definitely not as good as new, but hopefully better than it was gearbox. It's certainly a lot greasier than it was before. While everything was sitting for a while, these vice grips were holding the latch mechanism in place and this cardboard was keeping the hatch from closing fully and latching. The last thing we have to do before we can reinstall this is to slide back in our tape expanded bushing. With the now larger outer diameter, it was actually pretty resistant to being installed and we ended up using the vise to push it in. We'll apply a bit of white lithium grease to the inside and the outside of this link rod bushing. Once that's ready to go, we'll reinstall the reversing switch and tighten down its hold down screw. Then we can slide the whole motorized assembly back into place and get the pin installed. This required some long reach pliers and some prying, and you bet we had to commence the wiggling. It would probably be easier just to slide the thing out of the channels on the body, but we ended up getting it done this way. And once the pin was reinstalled, we could slide back on its locking ring. And with that secured, we can reinstall the three gearbox mounting screws. And again, since these are plastic threads, we'll have to refer to that same torque spec that we used previously. Unfortunately, there aren't any non-plastic gearboxes available for these, but at least one company does sell plastic gearboxes that have been reinforced with epoxy and a few bits of metal. I suppose the plastic gearbox is kind of a weak link in the chain deal, and if somebody slams the hatch, they'd rather have it break the gearbox than the whole back glass. The plastic housing and main gear are also used to electrically isolate the motor from the body ground. Due to the somewhat complex mechanism, the motor is switched on both ground and feed sides. So without some complicated manufacturing and at least a little bit of re-engineering, we're stuck with a plastic gearbox. As long as I'm gentle with the hatch and we all keep our fingers crossed, hopefully this one will last years to come. And here we go for the maiden voyage. We'll have to clean up some of that excess grease, but it does seem to be working just fine. It's a little bit sluggish the first few times, but pretty soon the grease gets pushed around and everything is moving freely again. But that doesn't mean we're out of problems to solve. I always felt like the hatch closed kind of hard and opened pretty harshly, but it wasn't until I saw this footage that I was totally convinced that it was closing too hard. This is an alignment problem, and it's not the only one. The length of this video is getting admittedly a little bit out of hand, and I think we'll end it here. But we're still not done working on this hatch. So we'll have to come back to this in the next episode where we'll work on the latch alignment, the alignment of the hatch itself, and try to get things sealed up. <laughs>